one was cuss. Okay, yeah. welcome back to the cuss-free episode of the first cuss-free episode of Ben and Emil. We've got a so, really big episode for you today, guys. We're talking about all the stuff that's going on with Boeing. We have a very special guest who is a um, an ongoing. He's a former Boeing employee. He is a turned whistleblower now. Very, uh, yeah, now advocate for flight safety and, and regulation yeah so we're going to get into that and before we do just a couple things up front we've got our live show coming up on may 8th in new york tickets are now available to the public they went live to ben and emile show members last week right. and uh they are now available to the public we'll put a link here in the description uh i don't know exactly how many tickets are left after this but Not a lot left it says uh, it says on the event right thing few tickets left so yeah. if you want to come see us in brooklyn on may 8th at the bell house i would go get your tickets as soon as possible because it says there's a few left. That's exactly right. And also next week for our subscribers, we're going to be doing our uh, monthly Q&A. So go get all signed up. Yeah, you, you know how it goes. And it's linked to the Discord and all that. BenandEmilShow.com. <laughs> um, but, uh, oh, also just one more point on that. I know uh, some people are having some trouble with some of the features on the app. We are releasing a native app very soon. Hopefully we'll have the exact date imminently We're but it's coming it. it's coming it's coming it's gonna be great you're gonna love it oh man i smell that garlic breath now dude i'm sorry yeah, it's okay it's okay i i <laughs> ate a gigantic falafel and it was it was that kind of garlic that just like stings your tongue he comes in and just goes i'm so sorry i, just I ate didn't all this garlic it didn't even think until it touched my tongue but now it's that kind of breath that's like emanating from deep within oh yeah oh man there it's, was a guy at the gym yesterday with that he had like an aura around him just a bubble, 15 feet, just the air was just, ugh. That's me. My man. Right now. Anyway. And if I start to sweat, this whole... God help us. Yeah. Okay, gang. What's going on with Boeing? It used to be, if it ain't Boeing, I ain't going. But now if it's, if it, now it's, if it is Boeing, I'm not going to go. If it ain't Airbus, I'm making a fuss. If it ain't Airbus, I'm making a fuss. Or in Airbus, I trust. That's nice. why we should have asked him that. Uh, well, so let's, let's catch you all up with the timeline, okay? So on Monday, yesterday for us, three days ago for you guys, there was a quote-unquote technical event that caused a 787 Dreamliner, which is a Boeing. Any, anything with a 7 in front of it is a Boeing. Anything with a seven in front of it. So yeah. Seagram seven and seven, that's a Boeing drink. Yeah, that's um, right. That's what they serve on the plane. Philadelphia 76ers, that's, that's a Boeing, a Boeing, com- that's a Boeing basketball Boeing. team. Yeah, they're an affiliate. Uh, but this 787 nosedived on a flight from Sydney to Chile, and 50 people were injured. And I don't think it was to Chile. I think it was to, I think it was Sydney to Auckland or something. That's like. what I read at first, but then it's, La- it was, it's LATAM Airlines. Yeah, it was meant to go on to Chile. Oh. Oh. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, they said, um, they, they put out the most bullshit corporate speak um, press line. A technical event occurred during the flight, which caused a strong movement. Yeah, no fucking shit. Yeah, 50 people got injured. And oh, man, I hate like, when to- a technical <laughs> event occurs when I'm... And tosses in, <laughs> people in the air. Yeah. <laughs> also, which is just a reminder to keep your seatbelt fastened. There's a reason why uh, they always tell you to I'll keep your seatbelt. I'll tell you what, up until like a couple of years ago, I was a, not a seatbelt putter on or on the airplane. I was yeah. like, what, what's this going to do for me? Also, and now I realize it can help you not get sucked out of the plane when the, when the door plug comes yeah, off. Yeah, or like that little boy who famously got his <laughs> shirt sucked off. I, <laughs> but so... The, the, same, <laughs> the, the same day, a United 777... <laughs> favorite oh god i love the triple seven also from sydney uh what's going on down under well it's not only there but a lot of these are occurring with united flights in and out of sfo because this one was bound for san francisco they had to turn around due to a maintenance issue but there was footage because thank god for these aviation dorks who i just love and they're always if you're taking off on an airplane you can guarantee that there's some guy, some sexless virgin out there with a camera filming it to put it on. I, I shouldn't say that. Um, I'm sure that they're fine. Anyway, someone got a video of it it's taking off. It's probably guys off. who are having lots of sex. Yeah, they're probably, you know. <laughs> they're probably truly laying pipe all the time. But, but <laughs> the, this 777 is taken off, and as the gear is retracting, there's clearly what appears to be fuel just 
dumping out of the. Uh, and it's not supposed to do that. That's not supposed. See, to See, I'm do not that. a plane guy. I thought maybe. Yeah, no, no, no. And so when they turned around and landed, the 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 tires were like smoldering, probably due to the friction, and then you know, um, the fuel being on there. But so then the same day, also on Monday. Another United, it was a 737-900, not a Max, but a 737-900 nonetheless, had flames shooting out of the engine. And again, they're not supposed to do that? It's not supposed to okay. do that. Uh, and it had to emergency land after takeoff. But, so this one's a little tricky, because it, it, it makes you at first want to be like, damn, it's another Boeing, which it is. And also, it might look sick as hell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I were on the plane, I'd be going, damn, we're going so fast. <laughs> Holy going. Shit. It was caused by bubble wrap caught in the engine. And and two two important things. So GE makes their engines. So it's not necessarily a Boeing fault. Not that I'm at all defending fucking Boeing, who I'm super pissed at right now. I'm not even <laughs> talking to not Boeing. Even talking. not talking to Boeing. They used but, to be boys. But bubble wrap. Okay, everybody, this, uh, this, uh, this very serious episode is brought to you by Blue Chew, where it's, um, I got to tell you, it is, Blue Chew rocks. It, it, it just works. I'm so fired up on Blue Chew right now. <laughs> no, you're not. I always but even if But if you were, it, 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 that's just a, a testament to how it works, because it's ready when you are. Exactly. It's not like you take it and then you're, you're and if you Whoa, don't I know, go. we're talking about Sex. Yeah, we're talking about sex. All right. Do you remember the days when you were always ready to go? Well, now you can increase your performance and get that extra confidence in bed. Listen up. We're talking Mm bluechew.com. It's a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra. But it comes in a chewable tablet and at a fraction of the cost. You don't have to deal with going to the doctor and having these embarrassing, humiliating conversations. You can do it all from the comfort of your own home. You just go to bluechew.com. Uh, it, it, that's it. it. It ships discreetly. Mailman's not making fun of you. Nobody's making fun of you. No one's making fun of you. When you're taking Blue Chew, no one's making fun of you. And if you've got a doctor who makes fun of you for that kind of thing, you should get another doctor. Or sign up for BlueChew.com and consult with their licensed medical providers because they're definitely not making fun of you. Yeah, anyway. They're they're, all made in the USA, too. That's another big part. They're prepared and shipped direct to your door in a discreet package. So uh, Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. Discover your options at (laughs) BlueChew.com. Chew it and do it. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code BAYES at checkout. That's B-A-E-S. Just pay $5 shipping. That's BlueChew.com. Promo code B-A-E-S to receive your first month free. Visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring this podcast. What's going on with the bubble wrap at the airports? (laughs) (laughs) Who's popping bubble wrap? anywhere on the tarmac or, or whatever shit. I want to know how that... We need to open up an investigation to figure out why there was bubble wrap. I, I feel like it's pretty easy. How? Why? Because you figure a lot of things are getting shipped. In, oh, sure. And, All right. And there's yeah. bubble wrap. And bubble wrap, you just need bubble wrap. Right? Yeah, that's true. Man, I just got um, I just got something in the mail and it come, it came with like primo bubble wrap i'm talking the classic tiny ones the time not this not the big stuff now and i just was just cracking that stuff do you ever twist them oh <laughs> brother do i twist them of course I, what am i what about was i born yesterday uh and so then on friday this last friday you had a united 737 max 8 run off the runway in houston they don't know. They they're still it's investing. Not in supposed it. to do that. I guess. Yeah, it's not supposed to do that. Mm. But planes sometimes do that when they're excited. Sure. They'll like run off the runway because they're just like, oh. So Boeing's having a tough time. Yeah, they're having a tough, um, tough time. Also, Friday, another United plane from San Francisco to Mexico City had to emergency divert to uh, L.A. due to a hydraulics issue. But it was an Airbus. It wasn't a. It wasn't a Boeing. And then last Thursday, an older, as everybody saw in the news, the one that kind of kicked it off was the um, older 777 United flight bound for Osaka from San Francisco. Lost a freaking tire. <laughs> Lost a freaking tire. Just popped off as it's taken off. Some, on some Looney Tunes shit, the plane lost the tire and it, and it fell down and crushed 
Uh, fortunately, nobody was injured, but it landed on on a couple cars. A sexless virgin. Yeah. <laughs> in the parking lot, and um, yeah, United came out and said, "Well, these ins-, and they're they're right. I mean, t- if we're gonna be, if we're gonna use our critical thinking skills here, these incidents, as they said, they are all distinct and unrelated. But uh, what? <laughs> Dylan. Oh, kicked he kicked the-, the camera. Dylan. God damn it. <clears throat> but also. Last month, we had a United 737 MAX taxiing at Newark. And as soon as it got to the gate, there were no incidents, but the pilots were like, yo, the ruddle, the foot pedal, fuck. Let me take that again from the top. The, um, the foot pedal rudders, the, that's redundant. The fucking rudders that you, that there the, we go. it's so the pilot can kick his feet when the pilot's happy. Yeah. It's just to absorb it. No, I'm just kidding. It's to steer the plane when they're taxiing, and also it controls the the rear uh, stabilizer fin when they're in flight. Uh, but they were stuck, and Boeing went out and uh, they resolved it. It was three replacement parts, um, but still a lot of fucking issues going on. Something stinks at Boeing. Someone shit in a bag and lit it on fire in front of Boeing, and uh, rumor has it the bag is still burning. <laughs> It's poop again. It's poop again. They couldn't get anybody to come out and stomp it out because they're too busy um, collecting and and counting their their money. That was me licking my thumb to collect in, or count invisible wads of cash. What? Why don't you tell us about the audit, man? Well, what's going on with that audit? Or before, what? What else? What? I I feel like we're we're uh, bearing the lead here. Okay. Because in the midst of all this. Awful Boeing stuff that's oh, going right. on. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> a former Boeing employee who's been a longtime whistleblower since uh, he retired in 2017. He worked at Boeing for 32 years. His name is John Barnett. Mm-hmm. Um, and he just, what it, they're calling a suicide, um, an apparent self-inflicted gunshot. Yeah. Which a lot of people are putting in quotes. Because uh, <clears throat> it's fishy. It's extremely fishy. You know, um, Boeing is trying to save face in the midst of all this. uh, And he is in the middle of delivering testimony in a defamation case against against Boeing. Boeing. And, you know, so it's all just very odd. He apparently shot himself in the hotel parking lot he was staying in on, you know, he got in the car to go to his to go give testimony and yeah. then just shot himself. According to his lawyer, he was supposed to do uh, the third day of his deposition on his whistleblower case. And when he didn't show up, they went looking for him and yeah. they found him in his. Uh, yeah. It's all very Michael Clayton-y. You ever seen Michael Clayton? Yeah, I've it's, seen uh, Clayton. It's, um, it's as suspicious as it gets with, with a company like Boeing doing everything that they've done to cut corners as, as John Barnett was specifically pointing out, like that was the case against Boeing. Basically, he was speaking up about how they were cutting corners. And Boeing has made it very clear they're fine killing people in order to boost profits. Truly, oh, they're totally fine. <laughs> so, it, I, I guarantee they they have they have in their lawyer speak or accountant speak have have uh, basically been like, well, you know, uh, all things considered, with these hundreds of people dying, the stock price didn't react as adversely as we previously thought and forecast show that blah, 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 oh, blah. Oh, 100%. Blah. We can endure another accident. So uh, they, they put it into the calculus of these things, undeniably. Uh, they put it into the calculus of these things of, about how much can we afford uh, how many mistake or how many how many new processes and oversights can we afford to skip again to kick the can down the road? If you know maybe there's an accident in another few years, we can afford to do it. If in that time the stock price recovers enough to make it you know fucking negligible, if that and so makes sense. <clears throat> Barnett had talked to the BBC about some of the things he wanted to speak out about, uh, and I mean it's all awful. You know, uh, he said that. Under pressure workers had been deliberately fitting substandard parts to aircraft on the production line. He said that he had uncovered serious problems with oxygen systems, which could mean one in four breathing masks would not work in an emergency. Uh, He also said soon after starting work in South Carolina, he had become concerned that the push to get new aircraft built meant the assembly process was rushed and safety was compromised, something the company denied. 
He later told the BBC that workers had failed to follow procedures intended to track components through the factory, allowing defective components to go missing. And then he said substandard parts had even been removed from scrap bins and fitted to planes that were being built to prevent delays on the production line. And they claimed tests on the emergency oxygen systems due to be fitted to the 787 showed a 25% failure rate. Um, Yeah. He alerted his managers and all these things. This is my, no action being taken. My favorite quote from him is, uh, so he had, he had been transferred in, excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. He had been transferred to South Carolina to work on the 787 and um, he was noting that this new leadership came in. God damn. He had noted this new leadership had come in uh, from the military side of Boeing from St. Louis, and they just kind of were like big dicks, sweating, like, hey, we can do whatever we want. We're, we're just going to run this shit. And he said, quote, they started pressuring us to not document defects, to work outside the procedures, to allow defective material to be installed without being corrected, bypassing procedures and not maintain, maintaining configurement control of airplanes. They just wanted to get the planes pushed out the door and make the cash register ring, which is a recurring theme you'll hear in our, um, in our talk with Ed Pearson coming up. Um, and uh, John Barnett had also been talking to reporters recently about these uh, the... Alaska Airlines door plug incident. And he said, quote, once you understand what's happening inside of Boeing, you'll see why we're seeing these kinds of issues. So what a fucking mess. Boeing, how could you? How dare you? Fuck you. Big, 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 big fuck you uh, to the CEO and the entire C-suite at Boeing. You guys are, um, you know, I, I would say at this point, you got a pretty good case for hell. Um, after you die. I mean, that's just me. I'm not necessarily religious, but if it exists, you're probably going. It's there. not looking too good. <clears throat> you know, it's not looking too good. But I mean, you it's can not still looking fix it. Good for them at all. You know. So outside of the John Barnett thing, you also mentioned the audit. It's uh, yeah, there was this six week FAA audit audit of Boeing and their subcontractor Spirit Aero Systems. Um. Obviously, another fucking mess. Uh, you don't want to get on one of these planes. They found multiple instances where the companies allegedly failed to comply with manufacturing quality control requirements. The plane maker passed 56 of the audits and failed 33 of them, oh. with a total of 97 instances of, uh, of alleged noncompliance. Uh, Can I give you my favorite one from Spirit? Dude, th- wait, is it the Dawn Soap? Uh, it's both. So the FAA because this one's fucking crazy. Yeah, yeah. They the FAA says that they observed um, Spirit. So Spirit Aerosystems makes the fuselage, the the body of the airplane that you sit in, and uh, they said that they saw Spirit mechanics using a hotel key card to check a door seal. I mean, I'd like to see them. What do the What do they suggest? I've seen the movies. That's how you get indoors. Yeah, you, you get, get indoors, <laughs> and they applied liquid Dawn soap to a door seal as lubricant in the fit-up process. The door seal was then cleaned with a wet (laughs) cheesecloth, noting that instructions were vague and unclear on what specifications or actions are to be followed or recorded by the mechanic. I don't know. I would say, like, just use the proper lubricant and then get a fucking shop rag to wipe it up instead of a wet cheesecloth. You don't think Dawn soap is going to do the job? I don't know, man. It it cleans up (laughs) oil-covered baby ducks or whatever the fuck, but... It's and it drives me now. insane, man. You know, you know the the sign of someone who's on the struggle bus. You go to their uh, kitchen sink, and they don't they they just have uh, dish soap for hand soap. Drives me up the wall. I'm like, how am I supposed to wash my hands? I'm about to dry the shit out of my hands applying Dawn I've, soap. I've been one of those guys. Yeah, of course you have. Plenty. I'm calling you out. Uh, the, yeah, that's this is particularly fucked up because Ben's been at my house and and said, why is there only dish soap? (laughs) Yeah, it fucking sucks when that happens. This this whole episode is basically just a subtweet at me. Yeah. Uh, uh, The FAA also also examined how well Boeing employees understood the company's quality control processes. Six engineers were interviewed and they got an average score of 58%. That's flunking. That's a flunk score. That's a fucking flunk score. I mean, it's been such a mess. I mean, this is all coming out now, but it's been such a mess over there for so long. I, there's, there's a, and all this stuff is now resurfacing again because of what Boeing is going through. But there's a, 
I think it was Al Jazeera went in undercover. And oh, was it was talk- 10 years ago. It was 10 years ago? Yeah. And they're talking to the... Uh, Employees. The, the engineers and the people working in the, in the factory, and they're going... I wouldn't get on one of these. Well, they're asking, would you get on one of these planes? They're like, no fucking way. I, I think it was I think it was 10 out of 15 of the factory workers they asked. They I said... I wouldn't fucking get on one of these. I wouldn't planes. get on one of these. I wouldn't get on one of these. Well, so... Um, <laughs> Yeah, let's. Uh, so we've got. Um, we're, we're about to kick it off with uh, Ed Pearson, and um, we hope you guys enjoy this little segment with him. He's a he's a very good guy, and we we had to really scramble. <laughs> Thanks to Ramy for. Oh God, excuse me, uh, Ramy Iacofano, who's uh, uh, produced this segment, and she made it happen really, really fast for us and if you don't follow her oh man she's she's the best we got all of her info in the in the description as well but all right let's cut to the interview hey everybody we we just got one more little break from our commercial sponsor here we've got incogni look there's a problem there's a problem all right data leaks are becoming more and more common meaning that your information and sensitive data is up for grabs Not why mine. is that a problem why is it a problem well it means that confidential information such as financial information contact details home address social security no. number shopping no. habits can fall into the hands of data brokers data, broker. no. <laughs> data brokers can aggregate your personal information and can sell this information to companies and even cyber criminals to be used against this you. This is a real thing. I've read about this. There are absolutely people on the dark web who broker these kinds of things. And anytime you hear about some kind of big hack out there, it's these people doing it. So the good news, that's the bad news. The good news is that you have the right to protect your privacy by requesting data brokers to delete what information they have about you. I mean, I was talking about the dark web. There's absolutely that. But there are these people. The, these Let's companies. talk about the light web. They collect it. Yeah, the, the not the dark web. The light web. They uh, you can you can request that they delete what information they have about you. But the bad news is that it could take you years to do it manually. No one's got time. But I have a solution for you, Ben. Can I give it to you? Yes. Incogni, baby. Incogni reaches out to data brokers on your behalf, requests your personal data removal, and deals with any objections from their side. Hmm. Since many data brokers collect your personal information again after some time, we also take care that our data stays off the market by conducting repeated ongoing removals. Incogni will constantly work to make sure your private data gets removed from these data brokers' hands and away from cyber criminals. Incogni will provide reports to you on how many requests they have made and how many successful removals they've had. You ever, you ever suddenly find yourself getting a bunch of junk mail? Dude, not only like junk mail. The, recently, I, I get people requesting codes for things like just, oh, uh, we're sending you your Microsoft code. It's just people just trying to get into my... Yep. It's and awful. that's exactly the type of thing that Incogni fights against. So use code... This is outdated. That's fine. Are you sure? Yeah. It must be, huh? huh? Use code PAYPIGS at the link below to get an exclusive 60% off an annual Incogni plan. That's incogni.com slash PAYPIGS using code PAYPIGS to get an exclusive 60% off an annual Incogni plan. Incogni.com slash PAYPIGS. All right, and we've got Ed Pearson with us. Thank you very much for joining us, Ed. Uh, if you want to just give us a, a brief background in who you are and um, what you've been doing these last few years as it pertains to Boeing. Sure. Well, thanks for having me. Um, again, my name is Ed Pearson. I'm the executive director for the Foundation for Aviation Safety. And it's uh, it's a group of people that have come together to try to um, shine a light on some of the things that are happening in, in the aviation industry that we think the public is unaware of. And it, it the roots of um, we have been working with uh, victim family members and uh, some people in the industry, but also in Congress and the federal government to make changes because we think that there's a lot of issues that are that are that are not um, going in the direction we want them to go and. Aviation safety is very important uh, to me. I worked at the Boeing company. I was a senior manager at the 737 factory in Renton, Washington, where the Max airplane was built. Um, while that plane was being built, um, I was uncomfortable, let's just say, about the the chaotic production environment and, and the dangerous uh, operations that were going on. So I attempted unsuccessfully to try to get them to shut the factory down. 
um, and it, it didn't happen. And I went up the chain and eventually we had the two crashes, uh, Lion Air and Ethiopian Air. Um, prior to that, I worked in the Boeing company in a variety of positions. I uh, worked in the flight test and evaluation organization. I also worked in an organization that was uh, involved in software development for the 787. Um, I had previously uh, run a couple small companies in software and also had served in the military. Um, I served in the military for um, 30 years. I flew in the military. I was um, a, a navigator uh, and naval flight officer, it's called. Served in a variety of positions, including um, maintenance officer, operations officer, squadron commanding officer. I was an ops center director. So I had a pretty uh, diverse background in the military. And, um, you know, I've always had interest in aviation since I was a kid. Um, and I know that you guys, uh, a lot of people ask questions of us in the foundation. Um, you know, tell us about the max airplane and explain to us what, what your concerns are and how do we schedule around it. And I guess I just wanted to share this one uh, story because I think it it's so compelling. Um, there's a gentleman his name is Paul Jirogi, and Paul is from Kenya. He grew up in uh, Kenya, and then he moved to Canada. He lives in Toronto, Canada now. He's a finance uh, person, professional. And um, we had Paul on our podcast uh, about a year, year and a half ago, and we were talking to him about the MAX disasters, and he said, you know, Ed, I, I didn't know. Had I, had I known, had I been informed, I never would have put my family on this plane and I never would have put um, my three kids, my wife and my mother-in-law on the plane. He lost his entire family on that plane. His oh my God. Members. Yeah. And um, that was pretty um, uh, heart wrenching to say the least, you know, I, you know, what do you say to a guy who, who lost his family? And, um, you know, I had asked him that anybody ever from the Boeing company ever apologized to you. And he said, no, um, and every month or so, uh, and we work closely with victim family members. Now they've become friends of ours and people that we work with. Um, and we, uh, help them. We provide technical assistance to them. Um, they provide kind of the heart and soul for the foundation because they don't want this to happen to anybody else. Right. And that's the last thing they want to have happen. And, um, Nobody wants another <laughs> preventable disaster. So we're, that's why we're ringing the bell. Um, in fact, that's why we called our podcast warning bells is because we wanted to alert people. So this has been something we've been working on for over six years now. Uh, even though the foundation is new, there's been a, a lot of effort to try to raise attention and people are, are um, hearing all the marketing, the imaging uh, about the airplanes, the Boeing company, what the FAA is doing. So I know you guys want to jump in, but that's sure. kind of a long introduction, but I thought it'd be helpful just to kind of set the baseline of where I'm coming from. No, that's great. That's really helpful. And I just want to reiterate. So you were, you were blowing the whistle, trying to run this up the chain, even before the crashes in 2018 with what you saw. Yes, that's right. Okay. Right, that's right. Um, before the first crash, I had gone to the general manager. I, I had talked to other senior people at the at the factory, but I went to the senior most person and said, look, this plane, you know, these planes are potentially unsafe and that we could have defects in these airplanes just from my own professional experience, but also because of my my teams were telling me this, that these people were, were, were that I work with were saying, you know, where people were making mistakes. Um, they were working people ridiculously long hours. I mean, like eight or 10 weeks straight with no breaks, um, sometimes seven days a week. Jeez. Uh, and these are building planes now. And we didn't have all the parts we needed. We didn't have all the test equipment. Um, it was just a, a disaster um, waiting to happen. And um, so I tried to get them to shut the factory down. You know, and I, I gave them examples of, of problems that we were seeing in our functional testing, like our electrical systems testing that was failing regularly. Um, some of our control surface testing, which is the the, the all the movable sur surfaces on the airplane, we test our um, hydraulic testing, you name it, engine testing. We were having all kinds of issues. And this is just and for the 737 MAX factory, right? That's right. Right. Yeah, the 737 uh, factory. And, you know, the 
corporate leadership was just pushing to get the planes out the door to sell them because they were, they were making billions of dollars. And right. then, um, sadly, the first crash happened. And then between the first crash and the second crash, I had uh, communicated with the CEO, uh, the board of directors, um, the general counsel of the company. And I tried unsuccessfully to get them to uh, to look into the factory as a possible cause for the crashes. And they refused to do that. And eventually, um, you know, the second crash happened. And then Congress got wind of this and uh, asked me to testify. And that's ever since then, you know, it's become a bit of an obsession for me and uh, some other people to try to, you know, get to the truth. I'm sure. I mean, after that very first crash, like going into work that day must have felt like a nightmare because it's something that you'd been ringing the bell on for weeks, months, I'm assuming. And then this disaster that you basically predicted could happen in the worst possible way finally happens. And you would think that everybody above you who you spoke to about exactly this would be a, a light bulb moment and just nothing happens. How frustrating was that? Well, just to get the timing correct, um, the whole thing was extremely frustrating. It is is ex is still extremely frustrating. But what happened was uh, I made a decision that I was going to retire early. I, I had planned to stay in the company for another six or seven years, but I just couldn't continue to work in that type of culture and environment with that lack of leadership. And so I had um, my my I retired in uh, August, and then the the first crash happened in October, uh -huh. and. I was actually, <laughs> believe it or not, I was assistant high school football coach just as a, you know, kind of a something to do, you know, because I really enjoy working with young people. And um, I was watching the, uh, the TV, but I was working on a scouting report. And that's when the Lion Air accident came up. <sighs> that's the first time I saw it. And uh, it was exactly how you described it, Ben. It was, it was you know, my stomach dropped. I was sick. Uh I couldn't believe it. You know, I'm watching on the TV screen and these people that are showing up at the airport in Jakarta, Indonesia, they don't even know what happened. And I know from watching the news that the plane had crashed into the ocean and these people were showing up for the first time. You know, you're watching this overseas, you know, it's it's, it's horrible. And um, my first thought was, oh my God, that was a brand new plane. It came through our factory it, it, and I looked it up and I it was, it, you know, it was only a couple months old, two months old. Um, and, uh, you know, I can't describe it. I mean, uh, then the, then the reaction was, oh, it was the pilot's fault. Right. I remember the, all the pilot's fault or the, or the maintenance people at Lion Air, there was no taking a no responsibility, no accountability for what happened, completely displacing this on, um, the pilots. And then, um, then everything kind of died down in the news because it was, oh, that was overseas. And that there was a lot of, you know, experts out there, all these professionals on the news talking about, you know, what a what a um, terrible airline in the uh, Lion Air is. And they were really, you know, criticizing almost an entire um, country. Right. They were saying and that they had like substandard um, protocols to follow maintenance stuff that that's just it's not like here in the united states it's a it's a essentially a third world country that's dealing with um this stuff of course they crashed kind of thing right yeah th yeah that's right there's a there's this unfair criticism that you know the you know somehow the u.s pilots and the u.s airlines would have absolutely avoided that same disaster uh and then of course the second crash happens and now they attempt to continue to blame the pilots. And then the United States pilots came out of the woodwork and were like, wait a minute, time out. <laughs> you don't stop blaming these pilots. Um, you gave us this bad information too. It could have happened to us. And we had some of our most you know, famous pilots like Captain Sully Sullenberger, for example, and um, a gentleman that I work with uh, all, all the time, Captain Dennis Tazier and, uh, they they were like, hey, this is this is not right. You can't be blaming them for this. They didn't know about this uh, software. They weren't trained on it. It, it took over the control of the plane, mm. um, and so all that started to surface. And now all of a sudden, they you know they started covering their ass. Excuse my language, but they started you know CYA, um, and then they then they withheld records and wouldn't provide the information uh, to the investigative authorities. Sounds a lot like what they're doing now believe it or not, with the Alaska Airlines accident. Um, 
and they went into cover up mode and uh you know and there was just thankfully there was some um congressional hearings that brought things to the surface the truth uh part of the truth i should say not not all of it um there's a whole bunch that we've learned in the last six years, a whole bunch that have happened and uh, about those airplanes and about, you know, the technical aspects of what caused it. One of the questions I had asked early on to the, to the seat, to the general counsel of the company back before the first, before the second crash, you know, cause he was telling me that they were um, talking to the investigators. And I said, well, is anybody, you know, looking at the factory and the possibility there could have been electrical problems and, you know, they didn't, he didn't want to go there. He said, well, that's up to the technical people. And I always had my suspicions that maybe, you know, why did the sensor fail? Because, you know, the sensor is a ruggedized, sturdy piece of equipment. It's not like it's, you know, super flimsy. And it's got a little bit of a, you know, about yay big um, uh, uh, weather vane like looking end on it. Uh, and I was wondering, you know, how did the sensor fail? I mean, you know, what could have caused that? And the more I dug, the more I realized that, you know, the manufacturing issues um, certainly point to that. Uh, the public has heard the story, you know, because there's been a whole bunch of, like I said, there's been a whole bunch of engineers and safety experts for the last couple of years talking about MCAS software, that it was the MCAS software caused it and the right. pilot lack of pilot training. And, and that's true. Those absolutely played a role. But why did the sensor fail? And that's something that I've been searching for, uh, interviewing people, investigating, analyzing it. And it's very obvious to me that um, those airplanes, both those airplanes had electrical defects in them, manufacturing defects in them that caused those sensors to fail. And that's what triggered these accidents. Um, right. So, and sorry, just to yeah. just as a kind of refresher, the MCAS software is what was responsible for it would kick in if the nose, if it thought the nose was like too too high up in that the plane was about to stall, it would override the pilot's controls and put it in a nose down pitch to to help it recover from or prevent a stall, correct? Exactly. That's it, exactly what it was. Right. And it was that that, uh, it was that new software because the 737 model up to that point was uh newer and like they had moved the engines around so the the physics of the plane were such that the pilots needed new training so that was all <clears throat> that was all the 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 story that I understand as a member of the public but what is this sensor you're talking about so the sensor is the angle of attack sensor that's what Got measures it. what you, that you were just describing and it was sending a faulty data to the software and the software then in turn uh, caused the um, motor that drove that stabilizer that caused the plane to go up and down. So right. the the sensor provided the, it's kind of like a speedometer, you know, sensor sending a, a signal to your, to your gauge, for mm -hmm. example, and it was sending, sending this false signal. <clears throat> and, um, you know, the, it's very obvious that the, uh, the company didn't want to admit to anything, right. They certainly didn't want to admit that they had any, you know, fault in the accident, you know, like we said, they tried to blame the pilots, then they tried to blame the maintenance personnel at the airlines. Then they tried to claim that these pilots were, you know, somehow not um, as skilled and qualified as U.S. pilots. Um, th you know, they did everything they could, to, but accept responsibility for what they did. And then there was uh, investigations that went on. And even I, even though I had testified the Congress and I provided tons of documents and the names of 50 people that they could talk to and, and different production records that they could look up. They didn't, they didn't go into the factory, the national transportation safety board, you know, you had a two month old and a four month old plane that crashed. We didn't find this out by the way, until last summer, not this past summer, but the summer prior, a mother who lost her daughter, 24 year old daughter, uh, and I were talking and 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 I was mentioning to her that, you know, I'm so frustrated that the National Transportation Safety Board <clears throat> really hasn't investigated this. And she said, well, let's let's have a meeting with them. I said, OK. So she arranged for a meeting. And um, during that meeting, I presented all this information to show the current problems that we're having in service right now. This is a, there's a lot of issues that are happening in service. And this was all before the last week or two of 
news, you know, stuff, there's been a lot of issues associated with the MAX airplanes that people are unaware of. We did a whole report on Alaska Airlines. Believe it or not, we had actually written, I had written a letter to the Alaska CEO in April of 23, telling him that we were looking at his data. And it was very obvious that there was a lot of production quality defects that, on his planes. On He had over 1,200 aircraft system malfunction reports on 53 airplanes. In a, in and that's not normal, airplane. right? No, no, yeah. and, it, and, it, and it's also it's also um, it's also concerning because it's not so much the number of the reports; it's the content. Like, mm -hmm. what's the top? You know, um, you could have you know more reports on on something that's not nearly as significant as say the engine, right. you know, of the airplane. But we were trying to alert him uh, to the fact that you know there's there's some indicators here that your airplanes are not are not good new airplanes and um you know and the, and and then of course there was the alaska accident that actually happened um and now everybody is realizing that all those issues that you know myself and and others were trying to to raise about the manufacturing problems that are occurring people are starting to light bulbs are going off and people are realizing that this is a lot more serious than they thought and you know and just in the last what two weeks you've had the um, NTSB come out, even though Boeing said they were, you know, fully cooperating and not, and going to be transparent. They, they obviously weren't even providing information to the NTSB. Um, uh, what do you, you what do you attribute that to? Is it, is it, um, is it, I don't want to say corruption on the government level, but is it, is it lobbying on the part of a, of a company as massive as Boeing? Is it, is it that they've got, um, well, isn't a lot of it? It's it's defunding and defanging a lot of these regulatory bodies, right? I think I think there was a lot of what wasn't a lot of this left up to Boeing at certain points, where Boeing was kind of self certifying and self regulating, uh, because yeah. bodies like the FAA just didn't have the resources. Just didn't, yeah, just didn't have the resources or the manpower to be going into these factories and and <clears throat> uh, facilities to to check in on things. Yeah. I would say you're both right. <laughs> um, I mean, you're you're both absolutely right. Um, there's been uh, a lot of deregulation. You know, the FAA, the three years that I worked in the factory, I never saw an FAA employee the entire time I was there. None of my employees that worked on the factory floor said they'd ever seen an FAA employee. I found out later, years later, they had four employees working at the factory and a, and a manager. And, and uh, you know, that's ridiculous when you have thousands of employees working in this gigantic facility, you know, two, several gigantic buildings sure. um, working around the clock to think that you could, you know, I, I said, look, you know, we had more administrative assistance in our group than you guys had, you know, monitoring the operations of the busiest airplane facility in the world. Now, you would think that that had, would have changed, and it really hadn't changed hardly at all. Even up to this day, they only have, I think they deployed up to 20 people now into the facility, which is a joke. Um, it's not nearly enough people to watch all these operations. Um, you have to understand that, you know, um, there's 30 airplanes in a building at a time when they're building them, you know, and that's 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 just on one shift. And then you have three shifts. Um, so but, you know, it's not like the FAA doesn't have the resources. People don't understand the FAA has got 45, about 45,000 people in their workforce. 15,000 are air traffic controllers, but there's still another 30,000 people. In fact, the Northwest Regional Headquarters for the FAA is a 1,600-person building that is, you know, 20 minutes down the road from the factory. And you have to ask yourself, you know, you have that many people that are right down the road. Why don't you put more of them into the factory? That was one of the, we had a meeting last week. I, I think I told you guys with the head of the FAA and the deputy, and the, uh, as we talked about, the deputy secretary of transportation. And we said, you need to put a lot more people into these buildings. You got to put them out there. And so they're at present, they're in the vicinity. It, it will have a very um, uh, amazing effect because now the stress and the pressure they're putting on employees, when you put an FAA person in that environment and they're watching this, they're going to have it, they're going to think twice about, you know, pressuring these employees uh, to work the hours that they're working, to cut the corners that they're taking, um, not to follow the processes properly. Um, you know, it, it's 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 really um, a lack of regulatory oversight. Emil, is that what you were describing? Is it 
it's it's a big part of that and uh yeah, so but do, there are resources available is what i'm saying and don't don't let anybody believe that they they have resources they yeah. just have to deploy them differently yeah do you have any insight on why those resources aren't being deployed correctly well i think it gets back to your point that you just alluded to which is uh that the uh boeing company doesn't want the faa in that right because right, right? they've got a record backlog that they've had for years and the That's higher right. the stock goes, the more likely the executives get their big stock-based compensation packages. And the more that they please Wall Street, the, the better the stock's performing, and the more it becomes a darling, and it just becomes this feedback loop at the expense of the traveling public. Exactly. So there's there, 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 there's an enrichment that's occurring. Uh, and not and I want to talk about the Boeing employees, if I can, for just a sure. second. Because I always have to caution this because, excuse me. There are some amazing, I mean, most of the people at the Boeing company are amazingly hard working, dedicated people, right? Even in the government agencies, I would say that. But when you have um, misguided leaders who who have messed up priorities and you guys, everybody has worked in an organization where they've had a boss that they thought the world of and thought that he or she was just amazing. They would do anything for. And then a new boss comes in and completely changes the whole, you know, the whole environment you know, we've all seen that. Um, and it really is about um, failed leadership. And and I don't just mean, I absolutely mean at the top level, like the, 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 the C-suite has is, is crushing and killing this company. They just continue to make broken promises. They're, they're out of touch. They're completely out of touch. They're rarely down with the frontline employees. Uh, and when they are, they make try to make a big deal of it. Like they're, you know, some rock star coming down and, you know, gracing you with their presence. Um, and 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 you have this uh, uh, government who the government and it's not just I, I want to be clear I'm not saying this is a political statement but it, this has been going on for years it, you know it, it crisscrosses all, you know all parties but you have this government uh, agency who's not doing their job you know who it's easier to sit off to the side and wait for something to happen and then act like they're doing something everything they're doing and I told the FA head I said you guys have become lazy. And you're and I use some other choice words um, that Ramey posted on her uh, her site. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, if you look in the notes page, we were very direct. We were very clear about these are serious problems that you need to admit. But you guys know it's like an addict. You know, if you have an addict or somebody alcoholic or whoever, if you have that um, in your family, or you know, anybody, if they can't admit it, that they're having these problems, if they, they're not going to go fix it right there's no so there's no admission that they, these problems are caused by the senior leadership there's no um admission that they screwed up um and that it was their fault um you know that these people died and the company lost 20 something billion dollars and there's criminal charges that are still unresolved and these families i mean imagine these families we work with these individuals every day we get emails and text messages from a group of them um you know, could you imagine losing a loved one like that and and then finding out every other month that there was a new revelation that had had they done the right thing never would have happened? You know, like right. constantly ripping the Band-Aid off of these people, you know, the wounds. And, and here they are, despite their losses, right, despite the grief that they still have and, and, the, and all that and, and the um they're out there fighting for all of us. Like they're out there to make sure that you guys and your families and my families, my family are not endangered by this uh, corporate greed, um, failed leadership. Um, and and, and I, I want to say this, if you don't mind, um, thank you guys for giving me some space here to talk because yeah, sure. I've, done, I've done, I don't know, a couple hundred interviews and usually get a minute or two minutes to, you know, try to package something complicated in. So I just want to share with you that um, when I talk about leadership, not only am I talking about the senior le level leadership, the senior people, I'm talking all the way down to the frontline employee. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, that frontline employee um, hopefully has been properly trained. If they have been trained, they know something that's not right. They know something is wrong. Right. And they need to speak up. They need to feel like they can speak up and say, Hey, this something's wrong here. I don't like it. You know, they need to have that, situational leadership to say, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable. I, I think we need to stop. We need to fix it. Right. And we've had people, many people do that and it's been successful and we've had people do it and they've gotten overruled by poor leadership, you know, above them. 
Um, but in some cases, there have been people who have just said, you know, it's the end of the day. I want to get out of here. My shift is over soon. I this is good enough, you know, and, and kind of thing. And, and we've seen those issues. We've had them in the factory where people have identified defects and said, oh, wait, how, you know, how did this happen? You know, and you find out that, you know, somebody made a bad decision. Somebody upstream the production system took a shortcut and and you hope you catch those things um you know but overall like i would say that absolute uh, you know vast majority of people are trying to do the right thing they're trying to do their job and they're trying sure. to um build the plane properly um and you have to understand also that i had that like i had an image in my mind that um you know, when I first moved to the, into the factory, I was expecting it to be like, um, you know, like a GM or a, a Ford factory with a bunch of robots and all this cool stuff. And, you know, if you need to put more, push more planes out the door, you're just throwing more raw material and kind of turn the knob. But what I realized was these are skilled employees. These are individuals who come in and get trained and they, they, they um, uh, it takes a lot of effort and work and we're not providing enough training for them. Um, they're being put on the line. I just found out that the employees are getting eight weeks of initial training. They're putting them on the line and then and eight weeks of training, you know, that's like the basics if that, and then they're supposed to get additional training um, from the called peer to peer training, they call it. But the problem is their peer, Ben is my peer, but Ben, Ben has got a job to do today. Ben has to do all this work. Yeah, ben but I want to go home. <laughs> right. Can we fix home, this tomorrow, right? man? <laughs> Please. Well, right. I mean, you know, it's it's uh, it's whatever, and and that's not you know you don't want people building planes like that. No, right? you don't want people to feel rushed. You don't want pe you want people to do the job right. Here's another thing that people don't understand: the company has removed thousands of quality control inspections, even after the two fatal crashes. Thousands and of quality control inspections. What is the rationale behind that? How does someone justify that? Well, if your planes aren't going to pass quality control, you got to get them out the door. So that's true. <laughs> I mean, but like, well, if, that's, if, that's one way. You would think that the, though that they're sorry that that their whole thing is like okay, we want to preserve uh, stock value. At the end of the day, that is what they're pushing for. Don't they have the foresight to to think like, hey, if uh, if we if we cut corners now, it's really going to bite us in the ass in the future. And it's going to, it's going to, um, right. Like right now you can see on, uh, travel companies like kayak.com, for example, they now, at first it was a bit harder to find, but now people, they're finding that people are using this feature so much they're, they're putting it more promptly, but you can now sort your flights by whether or not you'll have to get on a 737 max. Uh, so, I mean, it's obviously, I mean, the fact that the general public is now aware of different plane models, I, I don't think before, Yeah. I mean, well, let's ben, talk about that. Yeah, I mean, ben, so yeah. Sorry, my original question: Who no, no, the fuck? No, it's good. I mean, what you're saying, I'm I'm trying to catch up to you because uh, you made a couple points, Ben. I, I want to talk both what you're saying. So you asked the question, which is a really good question. Don't they have the foresight to realize they're just kind of you know cutting their you know nose off to spite their face or whatever the yeah. saying is? You would think that, but what we found is the senior corporate leaders they're not even they don't understand what's happening in the factory they don't mm. spend any time there so they they don't really so they have that same belief i think a lot of them maybe the board of directors in particular they have that same belief well yeah they, they we're going to increase production from 38 to 42 no problem we'll just throw some more parts at it they don't realize that the team is stressed out to the max just trying to build the planes that they currently have so they're they're because they're so far out of touch because they're so um unaware of the complexity of the operations and they sit in their corporate offices, they have no idea of the impact that they're making. So they're right. looking through everything they're looking through is a spreadsheet, right? It's it's a it's a stock price, a stock value. That's what they're focused on. And then, you know, Mil, as far as the the flights go, what you pointed out, um, yeah, some of those uh, places like Kayak are starting to allow you to filter out the max. But this is the problem, and I'm and uh, this is what happened to Ramy. It happened to my daughter Amanda four times in the last year. She purposely scheduled herself away from a MAX airplane. And, and for your listeners, that's a 737-8 and 737-9. Not to be confused with the 737-800 or 900 series. They're different model planes. Uh, I know it's it's a pain. Yeah. But um, 
737-8 and 737-9. So you schedule yourself away from it. And then you arrive at the airport and you you go to your gate and you find out that, oh, your gate moved or, oh, they changed the plane and you didn't even know about it. They didn't even tell you. And now you find yourself on a max. It happened to me last year. I was flying from uh, Seattle to Newark, New Jersey, and I did everything I could to avoid the max. And I checked before I got, you know, um, my my uh, ticket. I, I checked, you know, after I went to security, I checked when I got my coffee. Everything's good. Get on a plane. Wow, this is kind of new. Walked to my seat, sat down, looked ahead, and saw the Max card. You know, oh god, um, couldn't believe it. You know, and um, so I got off the plane and walked off. Yeah, and you know, the, of course, the flight attendant is kind of saying, "Why are you getting off the plane?" I said, uh, "It's a long story, but I, I I didn't schedule this flight." You know, and but that's happened to people and people that can't get off. They don't have the luxury to get off the plane. They don't have the money to pay for the extra ticket. You know, and so that's one of the things that we recommended to the Department of Transportation that, you know, passengers should be able to be notified, you know, just like you get notified if your flight time changes, you should be notified if you're if the model plane changes, you know, sure. yeah, you which, should be an informed consumer. Which begs the question for me, it's such a clusterfuck between the airlines and between uh, Boeing and the governing bodies. How would they fix all of this? Because there's so many planes in service. I'm sure the airlines would lobby hard against grounding all of these planes to implement whatever myriad fixes are necessary to really make them as airworthy as uh, as they ought to be, especially to please someone like you. Like, what do you, if you were in charge of it all, what what would you do to make everything copacetic? Well, first of all, I'm not saying I have all the answers, um, sure. but I would, I would say, you know, if I start with the Boeing company, you have to remove, you have to cut the, the head off the snake. I mean, you got to get the C-suite people, new people, new, new, new ideas. These people, the CEO, he's not new. I mean, even though people think he's new because he came in and the other CEO was fired after the max disasters, he was on the board for 10 years. Right. So that 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 C suite needs to go. They they just don't get it. Okay, and and I had one question for the board of directors for each of the board of directors. They need to ask themselves in 2023 how many times did I board you know board member actually spend time in one of the Boeing factories and talk to the people that are making their planes? You know, because I guarantee you, in one day a walk in the factory is worth 50 PowerPoint presentations, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's leadership right there. Um, the Boeing company also would ha- should have to admit that they're having all these production quality issues. There are still production quality issues. I mean, we've seen issues with flight management computers failing. Ray- Ray- I know this isn't going to mean a lot to people that are not, you know, aviation people, but I, I think you get the gist. We've seen flight management computers failing regularly. We've seen anti-icing systems failing regularly. That sounds seen- essential. Yeah. Well, also, yeah, it's isn't that essential. isn't that anti-icing thing? I thought I just saw something where they are telling their pilots like if the anti if the anti-icing thing is running for more than five minutes or something like that, it can lead to catastrophic failures on the plane or something crazy. And there's there's pilots who are putting sticky notes with you know <laughs> turned it off after five minutes and setting their iPhone yeah. timers. Is that is that? Yeah. Yeah, this is a world class, you know, um, <laughs> world class uh, airplane, right? You're putting sticky notes to remind yourself. Mm-hmm. And what you're right. talking about, you're right. The pilots, we found out this in August. In August, they told us, they told, you know, through this very bureaucratic rulemaking process that produces documents like this, which you can't even read. There's this tiny, tiny six point font that nobody reads it if they have a life, you know, but us retirees, <laughs> you know, got nothing better to do, I guess. Than <laughs> right. And we're, we're looking at these things, and we're finding out that, um, you know, the Boeing company knew about this like last year, you know, and, 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 and or, or earlier. It remind me to tell you about the electrical problem that just came up within the last five days. But what happened is um, these, these uh, with the anti-icing system, they, they realize even after this, even though this plane has been designed development for 10 years, we lose all those people. We had two fatal crashes and a 20 month grueling, supposedly recertification by the FAA. They now tell us that the anti-icing system, which is a pretty important system on the plane, isn't working. And it could possibly, if the pilots leave the um, anti-icing system on for more than five minutes in dry air, it could potentially dis, um, disintegrate the uh, composite material <laughs> into the into the engine, causing the engine a catastrophic failure. 
And and you're like, are you kidding me? I mean, and they're telling the pilots, you know, it's I mean, they're kind of busy up front. Those pilots are a little bit busy up sure. there. Sure. Remember whether they had turned it on in five minutes. There's no alert. There's no fault messages they get. And, you know, they're in and out of clouds. And how does how do you work? How does that work when you're in, in at, at night? Anyhow, you're going to turn your landing lights on and fly with the landing lights on. And it's ridiculous that they're expecting this. And they're and they tried to scoot this under without anybody knowing about it, you know, and they did some other things like that. Recently, they've they've requested engineering exemptions for everything from the stall management, yaw dampener, which is, is a computer in the back of the plane. It alerts you to when you're if you are going to be in a stall to the flaps, slats, electronic actuator, which actually controls the, the flaps. I mean, these are control surfaces on the plane. They're, again, this is important. And they're actually asking for exemptions and receiving exemptions from the, um, from the FAA on this. What the, the fuck FAA is the FAA doing? What what are they do? Like, wait, actually, while we're talking, while we're talking I about- I got a great, I got a, let me show you one second, guys. I want to show you something. Ooh. You just reminded me of this. I had to show you this. I took my uh, after after I testified to Congress, uh, my my daughter, uh, a friend of ours, found this thing. This is what this is what was shown. This car, I don't know who this cartoonist is, but let me see if you can see it. It's a uh, it's the FAA laying in bed, going, "This is your wake up call. Now get off." Your, oh, the phone is telling him to get off his lazy ass and do his job. Jesus, right. is it because there's a lot of former Boeing employees who've kind of. Uh, like semi-retired into the FAA? You know, they've talked about that. That's called regulatory capture where they just kind of rotate in and they get a new, another job and then they come out and get a big job. And they, so there's that, that's been a problem. But honestly, I think uh, it's been the fact that they have uh, lobbied successfully to have uh, less oversight. You know, yeah. uh, it's, it's actually called organization delegation authority. And basically uh, the engineering and in manufacturing as well, if you can believe it, um, the, instead of the FAA being there paying attention, they have a Boeing employee who's supposedly representing the FAA in the public interest. Um, but that person has to report up through a Boeing chain of command, you know, supervisory chain. And so you put this person in a terrible position because, you know, here they are trying to point something out that's not safe or manufacturing is not correct, but they have to go up their own Boeing chain to, to make it happen. It's a complete, utter failure. It's an absolute disaster. It's something else we talked about in our meeting on Friday with uh, the FAA administrator and the deputy. Um, and, you know, it was, it was initially sold that, hey, get out of the, get out of industry's way. You know, the industry could do it better. Government, get out of the way. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's, it's just stupid. And, and it's proven to fail. We've lost, you know, We've had plane crashes, you know, all this kind of stuff. And it all comes back to really horrible, horrible oversight. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, FAA people need to come in and tell Boeing what to do, but they need to be there enough in the presence so that Boeing employees knows that there's FAA watching. They are cognizant of what's being told. Last week, I mean, we can't even keep up with this crap. I'm not exaggerating. Sure. Last week... Last week, we get another one of these, you know, uh, notice a rulemaking government announcement that nobody's reading in six point font. And it says that the airplane has had, uh, get this, that the MAX airplanes, uh, this happened like two days ago, actually. MAX airplanes are uncommanded rolls. Like you're flying along and it just rolls suddenly unexpected, right? And what's causing this is... Uh, on the wings, there are these things called spoilers, which are these little flaps that kind of pop up. You guys have seen them, you yeah. Know? And they, the pilots use them when they're, you know, descending or 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 trying to slow down. Um, what's happening is these things are are deploying in 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 at altitude, right? Just randomly, and it's ca causing an upset of the plane. <laughs> well, what they found in researching this is that um, they're finding that there's electrical wire bundles. And what electrical wire bundle is, imagine you got a spaghetti noodles in a pot and you reached in with your hand, you pulled it out, right? And you had a whole bunch of, this is what these wires look like. They're, they're heavy bundles <laughs> of wires. And, and these wire bundles are being chafed. They're called, it's called chafing. The wire bundles are being, uh, uh, are routed incorrectly and they're routed over sharp edges. And you know, sharp edges on electrical wiring, not a good thing, sure. right? And this is what's causing these planes that have uncommanded roles. 
And and we found out, or one of our engineers in the foundation found out that um, actually they've known about this since July of 2023. And they're just now coming out with it. So this is, it's just, when you when you when you factor in the safety incident reports that have been occurring, you factor in all the engineering crap of you know sorry my language again of uh, you know uh, you know requesting exemptions. You're asking pilots to do ridiculous operating procedures. You have criminal behavior. You have removals of quality control inspections. They removed, like I said, all these quality control inspections. These were really important. You know, you know, you wouldn't want like my friend Dan would say, you would you wouldn't want to buy a washing machine to find out that they removed a bunch of inspections on your washing machine. You sure as heck wouldn't want to get in a plane right. and remove these inspections without the FA's knowledge. A lot of these inspections were removed. Thousands of inspections were removed. We have proof of this in documents now. They were they were they were removed. FA was completely unaware of it, if not for uh, some Boeing whistleblowers who, who were courageous enough to bring it forward. And the FAA took a couple months to uh, investigate. And when they concluded was, yes, thank you very much. You're correct. We've substantiated your report. And uh, I mean, the good news is they've added back a lot of these inspections, but the, here's the bad news. The really bad news is a couple hundred airplanes left Boeing factories without those thousands of inspections. Jesus. And so you ask the question, you ask the question, what could be done, Right. Everybody, that's a really good question. And um, besides the leadership change out, we have advocated, our foundation feels so strongly that we think those planes need to be grounded now, right? We keep exasperating the problem. We keep pumping more planes out the door and exasperating the problem. They need to be grounded. They need to do absolute top to bottom thorough inspections. They need to get to all the bottoms of these failures that are occurring and and, and decide if they can fix them or not. Um but continuing to deny these problems like an addict, you know, it, continuing to deny they exist and just happy, you know, just to get out of the news cycle and hope that travelers won't give it a second thought and won't, you know, and that's why consumers have to step forward and say, we're not, we're not putting up with it. You, you need to answer these questions. You need to, you need to take appropriate action. Nobody wants to lose another family member. And uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, I, I drank some extra coffee just a little while. Here, so I'm kind of, uh, <laughs> I mean, ahead, I'm, I'm extra scared with the new triple seven coming out because that's a that's like not twice the size of the seven thirty seven, but it's a fucking huge airplane. And I just wonder what kind of shit's baked into that that's it's too far to 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 backtrack now because it sounds like there's just rot all the way down between. Um, between parts, between Spirit Aero Systems, which is the which was spun off from Boeing in like 2005, which they, now I think they want to buy back. Yeah, which would be a good move <laughs> right. because both right. both I'm sure you saw both Spirit Aero Systems and Boeing just failed like the majority of their um, audits. audits from the FAA. So it's like I'm sure Boeing is terrified because this already over-engineered aircraft. Sounds like it's got so many flaws within it that they've got to kind of not start from zero again, but they've got to re-engineer so many things, which then, as I'm sure you could tell me, has reverberating effects throughout the supply chain, throughout the manufacturing process, throughout all of the uh, quality control things that would really set the company back, oh, God forbid, however many years. But just like communicate that shit to not only the public, but to the investing public. Be forthcoming. Yeah. Win back right. your 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 good great the 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 standing that you've got in in uh in in popular culture or whatever that that Boeing is a name you can trust by like you said getting getting the management out out of there. Ugh. Yeah, I mean you have to you have to you have to you have to clean house and you have to, you have to be honest about these mistakes. I mean we gave that presentation to to the deputy secretary of transportation because we also felt very strongly that uh, DOT has been you know, standing on the sidelines. I mean, they've been just, you know, we've, I've written to secretary Buttigieg four times, at least three or four times, no response, his assistance. And this problem, we happened this on, on the previous, uh, previous secretary of transportation uh, in the last administration, they just don't want to get involved in it, which is like, you know, one of our recommendations um, was that they actually create DOT, the federal government department of transportation under Mr. Buttigieg, they create a standing task force right now to work around the clock to, to, to answer these questions. Like what is going on? How bad is, 
you know, what does the FAA need to do? FAA is a subordinate agency, the DOT, right? And up until just this past weekend is really the first time I've heard Mr. Buttigieg go out and say, you know, we're going to, we're going to hold them accountable. It's like, you know, you need to hold yourself accountable. You, you, you have a lot of senior people that are paid a lot of money. Uh, and we told this to the DOT deputy that, you know, you guys are in a position where you're overseeing the FAA. Don't keep waiting for Congress to do your job because uh, Congress has been, you know, having to extract information out of the FAA. Um, you guys need to do your job and oversight the F, uh, FAA and and put a task force together, get to the bottom of all of these issues. We identified 30, like 35 problems, you know, and, and just you, know, you guys, tried- not even the government. No, this is just a bunch of, you know, of us in our foundation, you know, Jesus. a handful of people. That are, yeah. And so and 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 we and we're pre- pretty confident that there's a lot more, but these are the big ones. And we, you know, we wanted to come forward with solutions too, not just to say, hey, you're all screwed up and here's a bunch of problems. We actually stepped forward and said, we've got recommendations here for you, and we're happy to talk to you in more detail about this, you know, because we have some really talented people um that are on our, our on our team. Um but, you know, it's uh, it's unacceptable to be standing on the sidelines. You need to get in the game. You need to get your hands dirty, even if it might muddy your reputation a little bit. And you got it. You got to get a good handle of what's going on. Now, we feel pretty good about the new administrator, Whitaker, Mr. Whitaker. Um, he seems to be wanting to do the right thing. But we think that he's got an organization that needs um, a lot of you know CPR. They need a lot of or shock treatment because they've been very complacent, you know, um, while we're, the, while, the, while we're yeah. talking about the FAA, the, the FAA and the regulators, did, did, was it the FAA or the DOT? Didn't they just issue an order to, to Boeing saying you guys have basically 90 days to shape up? Yes. The FAA got ordered Boeing. You have 90 days to put together a plan to tell us how you're going to improve. Um, uh, the FAA told Boeing, you're going to have 90 days to, uh, tell us how you're going to produce production quality. And what we just told DOT is you need to give the same order to the FAA. Hmm. FAA, what are you what are you doing to ensure production quality? No is, fucking is, kidding. Right, because that's my question. So yeah. they issue this order, right? They what happens at the end of ninety days? You know, what's is are we going to see anything other than a, a slap on the wrist for Boeing? Or and I mean, is a, that even too much to ask for at this point? You guys are asking way too many good questions for for guys that are also yes! comedian. <laughs> Um, because um, I'm, I'm like going, dang! I should have reviewed that. Um, what, 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 um, what? The par- big part of the problem here is that um, it's all reactionary, right? So the steps that the FAA has taken, although to the general public may sound really impressive, oh, we're going to deploy. You know, we have 20 people doing an, an audit of the Boeing company, and those results came back, and they're horrible. I got news for you. Um, no offense to those 20 people, but um, I had 30 years of aviation experience, flew in the military and came into the factory. And it took me a good three months to just to be able to explain the basics of the of the build process. So I think they came in and probably did as great, as great a job as you could ask, you know, for the time that they've had. But it's inadequate. You know, mm-hmm. it's inadequate. They need more people there. They need to have uh, those people need to be properly trained so they can understand how the plane is built. So for example, we'd bring in a new employee in our group and that person would be, you know, we'd sit them down and say, okay, in this flow day, let's say it's flow day four, where the wing and the body are joined together, right? In this flow day, here's the significant build process steps that have to occur. Here's the suppliers that provide parts for these for this flow day. Here's the inspections and tests that get done in this flow day. Um, here's, here's how the sequencing of work is supposed to occur. So now you put an FA person there, not to do the job of Boeing, but just to be in the vicinity. They're going to hear people talking about, well, do you have your parts, or do you have, you know, do you have, do you, ha- you know, uh, just c- forget that test, you know, move forward. You know, they're going to be there, and they're going to say, whoa, time out a second, you can't be doing that. That's not how you're supposed to build planes. We gave you a production certificate, and you told us that this was how you're going to build the planes. Mm-hmm. A lot of these planes, I got news for you, they call this. This is a new term that I never heard shadow factory i'm like what the hell is that i asked my friend what's that he goes well because they're not building the plane in accordance with the approved plan by the fa the fa gave him a certificate and said you're going to build a plane and and every flow day this is what you're going to do and this is how you're going to test the plane before it rolls out completed well because they're not building the plane 
um, uh, act, uh, uh, correctly, they're having to build it out of, out of sequence because the uh, parts may not be there or the mm. people are not available, whatever. And then what happens is it goes out of the factory. It's not complete. It's not, it's still not complete. It goes out of the factory and it's in the shadow of the factory, meaning it's on the, oh, I love the balloons. Do I just do that? <laughs> yeah, you're, you made the, the hands and it's the new teacher. Continue, Sorry. please. That was just, great. Just, please, please, please tell me if a cat head sits on my head. Oh, we will. Uh, but anyhow, um, we're like, oh, th these, these, this work is occurring outside the factory. Right. And they're, 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 they're actually having large numbers of teams that are working out of factory because they can't build it properly. They're in such a rush to get planes pushed through the, you know, push them through the f factory. Right. That instead of stopping and building it right, it's more about getting, getting planes delivered. And, and yeah. so they're taking, when you do these out of sequence work. I think the New York Times just did a story about this. You know, we, we explain, I explained it with the Congress. You do this out of sequence work. And what happens is, the person who's supposed to, let's say, Ben, you're supposed to get your job done in, in flow day five, but your parts aren't here. You can't get it done that day. So also, I want to go you, home. So you want to go home, right? <laughs> you want to go home and, and and your cohort crime crime shows up for his shift, but he can't start his work because right. you didn't finish yours. Well, then you wait a couple of days and all of a sudden your parts show up. And guess what? Ben, you got to go down to flow day eight now, get that work done. And don't forget to come back to flow day five and get the work that you were supposed to get done today. Right? And then that this all gets is, backlogged. It's just a cascading Jeez. disaster. You got hundreds of employees doing this. And, and that know, would make quality control an absolute nightmare, rigmarole. Hence, probably why a lot of it just gets skipped over. I'm starting to kind of see a bigger picture here with all of this shit getting screwed up and out of sequence. It's no wonder that quality control falls through the cracks if it happens at all. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a thing that, um, if you walk into the factory, there's an area they call the mezzanine. It's this gigantic walkway that you can look down on the factory, right? And, you know, we bring all the visitors there. So the news reporters and the VIPs, and they get a tour of the factory. They walk along this mezzanine. And when you're up at that height, it's like in a, being in a city. And, 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 and you know, when you're at a certain point in, a, in a, say, a condo in the city, you can't hear the city noise. You know, you can't hear the street noise because you're just up high enough. The sound is attenuated. Well, that's the same thing in the factory. So you walk in and you're like, wow, it looks pretty quiet and calm, right? Like, but then if you went down you know, 30 or 40 feet and got on the concrete floors of the factory and walked around, you would hear the city. You would hear... You would hear all the sounds of the employees that are expressing frustration because they can't get a quality inspector or their te their test equipment failed or, you know, the person's not available to know how to answer that question. And meanwhile, push, 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 get the plane down the door. And, and I know this is really terribly not. Uh, what's the word? Not um, confidence inspiring what I'm telling you guys. And it, this is not how Bill Boeing wanted to build planes either right that the company has been built on quality right and you know kind of like kind of like these right you know you wouldn't expect these to fail and, and you know we become used to this high quality that's what we should be expecting of airplanes right well, and 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 that's what we've lost and now we've we've, ex we've accepted this substandard workmanship and it's good enough. And it's not good enough because people are getting on these planes. And and so let's talk about that confidence for a bit because uh, I'm sure we've spent, I don't know, however, it's this past 45 minutes maybe scaring the audience a bit. Um, but <clears throat> I'm curious kind of where you think this leads. I think, you know, Boeing's been having a, a, a bad go of it recently, and, but it, yeah. and we haven't seen the, you know, catastrophic deaths that we've seen in, in 2018, but it seems like they're they're kind of skating by with it a little bit. You know that Alaskan Airlines flight. It's it's if they were just a bit higher, people would have been sucked out. If people um, didn't have their seatbelts buckled, you know we're talking about people dead on that flight. Uh, there was just another one in Australia. Yeah, I don't seven eighty seven. Yeah, where I I don't think we know the exact cause yet, but another yeah, Boeing drop down. Yeah, but I think you're talking about fifty people injured on that flight. And so, uh, is this a ticking time bomb with Boeing planes? I mean, you're talking about hundreds of planes going out without the correct quality control measures, uh, or I mean, it's also hard to tell. It's one of the safest ways 
to travel still. I mean, you know, you're talking about we don't have people generally feel pretty safe getting on a plane um, and we don't have like massive death toll to, to maybe back up this kind of like alarm. Yeah. I yeah. just want to piggyback yeah. that. Sorry. I, Cause I mean, we've yeah. talked a lot about the 737 and my question was going to be, is, is it getting to the point where we should be concerned? Cause I know you've said you'd be fine getting on any kind of legacy Boeing aircraft, like a triple seven or the older 737s or any number of, other planes but now i mean with all of this shit going on it's clear that the fault doesn't just lie with boeing which it absolutely does but um in part but the airlines as well in their shoddy maintenance in pursuit of the same exact corporate greed and ever higher uh, margins and, and profits so yeah, but we're talking about brand new planes oh yeah experiencing these uh, right these. yeah the, you know you guys i'm gonna just kind of hit each one because um, you know, it, 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 air travel should be the safest form of travel, right? It's supposed to be, and it historically has been that way. And, you know, myself and my family travel, and we still have to travel in the midst of every, all, all this, right? But what these are, what these are, I would say, are unnecessary risks. Like, it's one thing if you have to fly and you end up in bad weather, you know, something happens and you end up flying through bad weather. You know, that's understandable that that kind of thing might happen. You, may, you Maybe you, you didn't see the weather on the radar or whatever. But these are preventable risks. Like, these are, you know, and these airplanes have to last 30 years or more, right? That's what they're designed to last. So so you have planes that are brand new that are coming out the out, out the building with with problems, I mean, all all your alarms have to start going off and say this is this is not normal, right? This is not this is abnormal, and we need to do something. And it it is. And 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 you asked a question about a ticking time bomb. That comment, that exact phrase, has been used with victim families who feel like, you know, and and this is what motivates us because we're like, you know, I I haven't been able to really, you know confidently get a great night's sleep, you know, ever since I worked in the factory. Even though I flew in the military, I was never uncomfortable you know, like I am now with, with, with what I know. So I think that um, you shouldn't have to worry about these problems. You should absolutely be able to get your latte and, you know, and get on the plane and put your, put your bags and, you know, put your feet up and, you know, watch entertainment or whatever. Um, but we've gotten lazy. We've gotten complacent. We've gotten acclimated. We have um, flight crews that are seeing repeat failures. And instead of saying, wait a minute, this is completely unacceptable. They're like, well, you know, it, it, it's, it failed the last time, you know, and it just happens, you know, it's unacceptable. Cause when you look at accident investigations and, and you, and you study accident investigations and you look back, there's, there's some, some things that actually happen and, and they're called precursors. And, and almost every accident, if you go back, you find mm -hmm. out that, um, there was problems with that airplane prior. There was there was problems, you know, e, the Ethiopian plane, the E three E T three hundred two plane, also had uncommanded rolls mm. at low altitude. Um, there are there are indicators of potential problems, and if if the airlines are like you said, pushing to get the planes out the door because they're making money on this, right? They don't make money when the planes aren't flying, really. Um, they're a part of the problem, right? If they have a problem with maintenance of uh, system failure, and what we're seeing is they they fix it and then it recurs and they fix it and it recurs. And a lot of that is because they're not getting to the root cause, which is the, partly a big responsibility of the FAA. There's a whole program where they're supposed to work with the manufacturer and the airlines to get to the bottom of these problems. So yeah, people do feel like it's a ticking time bomb. I got to tell you that I have that sense in my in my in my in my stomach, and that's why I wrote to the letter of, of Alaska, um, and we wrote that report in, in September. So we, but this is all avoidable. And and and, and what I want to leave you guys on the positive note. Okay, I'm going to go back into coach mode here if I can. Um, here's the positive note: we have incredible people that are capable of building incredible airplanes and and the, and there are people that are capable of operating and maintaining these incredible airplanes this is all we've done this we know how to do this but we have to be honest when we see something that's not right we got to fix it we can't just accept it and 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 try to ignore it and then just play you know play 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 you know roulette it's not how we should do business and and over over time these things can bite you and the pilots will tell you um, that 
if they have one emergency, I've never met a pilot in my whole life. Never. You said, hey, if you have this emergency, can you handle it? Oh, yeah, I'll grab my checklist and I'll I'll talk to my co-pilot. And, you know, if I have to get assistance from the flight attendants, you know, we'll, we'll do whatever we got to do to deal with the problem. Well, what happens if you have two emergencies simultaneously hmm. or, or three? Or what happens if you're in bad weather and you're landing and there's and a lot of traffic? You know, there's other factors here or you're or you're tired. And by the way, most pilots, when they fly with each other, that may be the first and only time they they've worked with that other person, because it's not like a military, you know, where you you get to know your 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 your, your peers. Um, these individuals are professionals and they do great work, but they these pilots should not be exposed to these kinds of um, unnecessary risks. And, and that's what we're trying to do. And, you know, you'll hear people say, and I've heard this over and over again, like Boeing was saying this. The MAX airplane has flown, you know, 6 million miles successfully, per, you know, no problems, right? You guys have all heard this. Yeah, it's um, the most scrutinized plane in history, 100% safe. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, those millions of miles tell you nothing about the individual quality of individual planes. Every sure. airplane, like your vehicle, is unique. When it was made, how it's operated, how it's maintained. And you guys, can, you can imagine that there are airplanes out there that are highly, you know, maintained and they're they're operated and you know and then there's some that are not and 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 so millions of miles flown safely is is really a worn out outdated statistic it tells you nothing about the individual quality of these planes another comment you'll hear is well the max airplane has had 98% dispatch reliability which means that it's gotten off the ground 98% of the time on time well that's not a measure of safety in fact Lion Air Flight 610 and Ethiopian Flight 302 had 100% dispatch reliability, as my friend Joe would tell you. Um, so these we're talking about mitigating risk, right? M reducing unnecessary risk, and and that's and and so that's what I'm trying to get to you guys. That's what I'm trying to share with people is that these are unnecessary. These are things that are fixable, um, but but not with the current, not in the current environment. Right, and that brings I we should I guess we should probably get close to wrapping it up. Yeah. There's one uh, one big question I'd like to ask, just to dovetail off of that is: Is there anything that we can do as members of the flying public to push these companies to once again prioritize safety and quality over profit? Like I'm sure that there's congressmen or so, congress people we could contact like what is there that we can do besides just canceling flights or rescheduling flights well that's a great question a couple of things i mean ultimately you guys the consumers have ultimate power even more than anybody you know you can you can do what a lot of people are doing and they're scheduling themselves away from the max airplane right that's one thing another thing they could do is demand the congress uh and the department of transportation alert people to when their airplane models change because mm -hmm. that'll put an immediate fix to this uh, chronic uh, shuffling that occurs, you know, and people get, you know, forced to fly a plane that they don't want to fly. Um, I think a put in pressure on the Department of Transportation, Secretary Buttigieg, to, to actually really thoughtfully, comprehensively go in and try to find out what's wrong um, and, you know, and that's why I'm advocating for a round the clock task force and really, you know, really spend some time and energy on it. Um, I think another thing that could be done is you guys can 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 talk. We can talk about it and and ask hard questions. And I think sometimes they don't want to answer them. You know, when we went in and gave this presentation to FA and DOT, we went in there very consciously with with the goal of not getting distracted and going off on a bunny trail on any one of these problems. We could have stopped and talked for hours on, you know, we were like, no, what we're trying to do is we're trying to transmit to you that these are problems. These are real problems. You're duly informed. You cannot claim, you know, plausible deniability. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, they can also call their legislators. And, and, and there's two groups of legislators that they should focus on. One are the uh, congressmen and women who work on the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. That's Congressman Graves' committee, and the other one is the Senate Commerce, uh, Science, and uh, Science Commerce and Transportation Committee. That is uh, Senator Cantwell on the Democrat side, and and Senator Cruz on the Republican side. Those okay. two committees uh, provide oversight of, of 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 the executive branch agencies like DOT and FAA. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, um, tell tell you know. 
don't buy stock, right? I mean, don't, don't, don't buy a stock in a company that is not doing the right thing. That's my opinion. Um, those are things that people have, you know, you guys, we all have more power than we maybe realize. And until that happens, and the last thing I should say is there's accountability, the criminal accountability that needs to happen. Um, Boeing signed this deferred prosecution agreement with the Department of Justice. Um, and that agreement was a three-year agreement. If they kept their nose clean, they could go ahead and, and actually there would be no criminal charges to uh, the executives um, because you know that they were not being charged on an individual basis. But now the courts are revi revisiting this because um, the the belief is that the families they never got their victims' rights. Um, they were never cons cons uh, consulted, and so now they're trying to pursue additional. Uh, criminal investigation. And so, you know, we should demand that the Department of Justice and the FBI actually go out and investigate this. You know, um, I, I've written a personally written a 20 page uh, letter to a, a, a DOJ official outlining what I felt were criminal, criminal behavior. And we just our foundation just sent a seven page letter to the judge in Texas um, outlining what we think is evidence of uh, failing to comply with the terms of the DPA. And, you know, you, you, you start holding some of these uh, corporate executives accountable for what some family members have called corporate homicide. You start holding these people accountable for what they're doing. And all of a sudden, things will change. A lot of people will say, I don't want to be that person. It's not worth it to me to do, to do that. And um, so there's a lot that can be done here. There's a lot of solutions. It's not hopeless. Um but it isn't going to get better just if we sit and stick our head in the sand. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, I'm going to Hawaii in a couple of weeks on a 737. So I'm going to see what I can do there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I said, I'm, 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 I'm sorry to have to say this. Don't be um, sorry. Uh, we, I'm yeah. so grateful to you for what you're doing and what your foundation is doing. I mean, without you, who knows... Uh, I mean, we've seen what happens when you leave these people in these institutions and companies to their own devices. And uh, yeah, we, we, the consumer, the flying public just get... The loser consumer. Yeah, the loser consumer, as we call ourselves. We just get the shaft every time. So, yeah. But uh, so where can people find you? We, you've got a podcast, you've got your foundation, anything you'd like to plug? Um, you know, I wasn't, I, um, yeah, I mean, we have the foundation for aviation safety. Um, it's foundation for aviation safety.org. It's, it's a new foundation. You know, it's not, we're not like, obviously the people on the foundation have been working on this for a while, but the foundation is new. And again, our objective is just to shed a light on, on this stuff. You know, that's, that's, that's all we want to do. We want right. to do what that gentleman who lost his family said. Um, and then, um, you know, I have a podcast called warning bells. I'm not a professional podcaster. I don't know if you guys can sit. You guys are way more polished than me. Yeah, man, you're doing um, great. Well, um, you know, I never envisioned being a podcast host, and uh, but we just created that because we thought it was important to, to get the word out to the public. So, you know, feel free to listen to that, and we're getting good feedback on that. And then, um, yeah, that's about it. I mean, um, we, you know, I think the, the one message I want to leave you guys with is that um, a lot of people died and these family members are still fighting and um, they deserve our support, you know, because uh, they're right. They've been right all along. Right. Huh, well said. Um, Ed, we thank you so much for your time and for everything that you're doing. And um, yeah, we really appreciate you coming on yeah. and fighting for people's safety. Yeah. It's yeah. very important. Unlike us, my, who my, who make you know, <laughs> dick and <laughs> dick jokes and stuff. Yeah, but you, what you guys are doing, honestly, it's it's kind of like the John Oliver show. If you've seen the John Oliver show, sure. If you haven't seen, if you've seen the latest one he did on Boeing, it's it's a uh, it was uh, it, he did they did a great job. I mean, it, it's dark humor and it's you know, but it, it it's effective because it, it it educates people on what's happening. So anyhow, right. thank you guys for what you're doing. Um, it it is really important what you're doing and uh. <laughs> Even if you're doing it with with a smile on your face, it's it's important to get the word out. That's right. All right, Ed. Thank you so much for your time. We Thanks, really Ed. appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Have a great day. All right. Bye. Take care. Do I nope. Damn it. <laughs> oh, I think he was going to say, do I need to do anything? No, you don't. <laughs>
<laughs> no, you don't. Was, I'm sure. He, oh, dang. Do I need? I should have. <laughs> I I shouldn't have just ended the thing. I shouldn't have just ended it. I should have been like, okay, yeah, and we'll we'll cut right there. <laughs> Jeez, Jeez Louise. Oh man. Do I need? Ed, uh, he was great. Oh man. Well, but anyway, folks, um, join us in the in the bonus episode. If you if you've uh, enjoyed this episode, you'll be sure to enjoy a lot more brevity in there. Uh, ben and brevity show. or levity? Levity. Fuck! What's brevity then? Brevity is bread. Brevity's beans, dude. Brevity is when the bread rises. <laughs> Isn't, wouldn't brevity be the? I don't know. The short. The, the, I'm Googling brevity. This I don't know. Insane. Either way, we're putting levity and brevity, the beans, whatever. <laughs> whatever just yeah, said. Brevity, brevity is concise and exact use of okay, words in writing. Then I, oh, you I are thought. using brevity to correct me here in that I should have said levity. There hey, we go. if you guys want to bring some brevity to your life, join us at benandemilshow.com. Yeah, all right. So long, everybody.